objection. WMATA has no objection to those recommendations being made public, do you? Okay. The recommendations by Mr. Gunn? Mr. Gunn, yeah. Uh, uh, we have summarized it. This was a confidential report that was given to our board, and we have summarized the recommendations that he made, and that has been provided to the press. We would appreciate if the report itself were left as a confidential report. Do we have the full report? Yeah, I would, I would encourage you, and we'll work with you, to, to try and make sure that all the recommendations that were made to WMATA are made available to the public. It seems to me WMATA is a, WMATA is a public agency. Uh, this was done with the purpose of trying to strengthen the safety of the system, and I think I would strongly encourage you to work with us to make sure that those, uh, uh, those, those finding conclusions are, are, Mr. are made Chairman, available. May I yeah. Choir here. It, I mean, let, let me just. I, I, I think that uh, is it true you make okay. Well, we're going to have to. We'll pursue this between now and the end of the hearing because we feel strongly uh, uh, that that this information that the public has a right to to know this information. We'll, we'll and, be happy uh, to work. I, with I don't know if uh, uh, so. Let, let, let me move on, but because um, I'm going to ask you some questions about the gun report, which are also relevant uh, to this this hearing. Um, and my, my Mr. Sarles, have you had a chance to familiarize yourself with the gun report? Okay. Yes, now, I have. Okay. So my, my question to the two of you is we've now heard from Mr. Mr. Rogoff. Uh, you heard his testimony, uh, which said, you know, we, we need a top to bottom a change in the safety culture at WMATA. He said safety concerns were marginalized. Uh, he's gone on to issue his report with specific re recommendations, uh, and Mr. Gunn uh, has also issued a report with recommendations. My question to the two of you, one is interim general manager, the other is chairman of the board, do you agree with the recommendations that were made uh, by the administrator? To the extent you do not agree, please elaborate, uh, and do you agree or disagree with the recommendations that were made by Mr. Gunn? And that's why it's going to be important that we uh, make this information available to the public? Uh, the simple and clear answer is yes, I agree with the FTA recommendations, uh, and I, yes, I agree with Mr. Gunn's report um, based on my own experience in the industry. Uh, let me talk to the FTA uh, recommendations first. They hit on communications, they hit on hazard analysis, they hit on roadway worker protection. That's the basic areas when you look at the details. Uh, my first impressions, it's only three weeks here, is certainly uh, there's need for significant improvement in communications within WMATA. Uh, and this doesn't extend to just uh, safety, but it's uh, the nature of the current nature of the operation. I think that's just reflective of what has happened over the last few years in terms of funding, changes in administration, reorganization, changes in leadership, a safety officer being one case, general manager being another case. Uh, so there is a tendency to go into silos. That has to be changed, and I've already started working on that. With regard to hazards analysis, uh, that, to me, um, one of the important things is that you anticipate problems before they become accidents. Doing hazards analysis, getting near-miss reports, um, getting good upward and downward communication, it helps you identify those problems before they come, become major problems and address them and avoid those accidents, so that's extremely important. The whole issue of roadway worker protection is extremely important. When I worked at Amtrak, I personally got trained in that because I was out in the right-of-way. I understand how important that is. So there's been a very active effort underway, uh, started certainly before I got here, involving the staff that work there, the unions, in a very collaborative uh, approach, including the representatives from the TOC, to develop a, a very robust worker protection pro program that is well underway. Uh, it's expected that the actual manual be issued by the end of the year. All, uh, one of the most important things that goes with all this is training. People have to be trained uh, to understand what is right, how things should operate, and then that should be reinforced. That has to be done, and that's some of the points that Mr. Gunn made. Uh, I agree with him that uh, um, the fact that uh, there has not been sufficient investment in state of good repair, which is not unusual for this or, uh, particular subway or metro rail, it's the same thing in other parts of the nation, does affect uh, the level of uh, reliability operation. Uh, certainly over time could affect the safety of the operation, but safety has to re remain number one. 
priority. Um, and you, you have to have the leadership in place, a stable leadership in place that continually focuses on, on safety and state of good repair. If you continue to change the leadership, it impacts the ability to do that. Thank you, Mr. Benjamin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me first of all associate myself with Mr. Sarl's remarks. I, I agree with what he said. Uh, and I fully support all of the positions relative to the FTA report. I think it has brought up some significant issues, all of which we have to do substantial work on. And uh, I'm very pleased that Mr. Sarles has started on that process. And uh, we have every intention of completing it and dealing with the issues that have been raised. And in particular, those associated with the safety culture and communications. Uh, one of the communications issues which uh, Mr. Gunn also raised was the concern about uh, what he called kill the messenger. If you, if you could bring your mic a little closer, yep. please. Thank you. Uh, what he called kill the messenger, uh, that is where a staff person tries to report information up the line and instead is criticized for it as opposed to supported for it and, and told that if you've identified a safety issue, it's a great concern. Those kinds of things need to be changed. And we're going to have to make a major effort to improve our communications uh, and change the overall culture of the system from the bottom to the top. Uh, there are areas in Mr. Gunn's report where he has made recommendations that reflect his personal bias as an individual or his personal history uh, as you know, he was with uh, this authority for a limited period of time as a general manager. And in fact, during that time, he's the person who appointed me the uh, chief financial officer of Metro. And so I'm a, uh, a strong advocate of Mr. Gunn. And I was one of the people who strongly wanted him to come in. But he's one voice among many. And all of his opinions are not necessarily those that we on the board would fully agree with. Uh, and what we did is we asked him to come in knowing that he had that type of an of, of a, uh, experience and tendency to make reports so that he could be one of many voices that we could hear in making decisions. Uh, that having been said, I, I'm not sure I agree with his uh, suggestions for organizational structure would ten tend to move towards traditional rail organizations uh, intercity rail organizations and how they would structure as opposed to uh, transit rail organizations. But that's something that I think I would rather leave to uh, the general manager, the interim general manager, and the permanent general manager when they are selected. And I think his uh, positions on governance reflect an experience that he had many years ago and not necessarily the way that the board and the senior staff of Metro work at the present time. Let me, let me just be clear. I want to I want to commend the board for bringing him in. Number one in recommendations. I think that uh, th those recommendations are all in your binders. Uh, as a committee, we believe the public has a right to know. We intend to release the report. I think it's important that it be done with your your testimony because I think it, it, no one's suggesting that it is the it's going to be the adopted. It's been adopted by WMATA. There are recommendations he made. You may agree with some of them. You may disagree with some of them. And in that. Within that context, uh, I think it's important to make it available because uh, it is part of the public discourse. You as stewards of WMATA are obviously critical to that oversight process, and it should be part of the, the, the dialogue. Uh, but I, I appreciate the fact that you indicated where you may have some disagreements um, with his recommendations uh, uh, going forward. Uh, let me turn it over to Mr. Bilbray. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think uh, Mr. Benjamin, I should give you a chance to respond to my diatribe about the system's um, preemption of, of uh, the use of technology and the, uh, and the way we stacked it up. I mean, you have any defense for, or you, you've got any counter to my statement about the fact that we're actually using technology op, um, in a way that was assumed to be the cutting edge for the future in the 60s and the early 70s, but by 1980 we knew that at least a lot of people were claiming that that was, that was a uh, wrong assumption. And I think in all fairness, we ought to remember that a lot of these systems back in the late 60s, early 70s were designed with the assumption there would not be an operator in the cap. And later, that was stuck in. You have mm -hmm. Your comments on that as somebody who's been on the board? 
Uh, Congress, Congressman Belbray, let me, let me first uh, note that one of the uh, observations that you made is really important, and it applies very strongly to Washington Metro. Uh, when the Metro system was originally put together, when our compact was passed, the direction was for Metro to build but not operate a rail system, and it was not to run a bus system. So the people who originally designed and built Metro we're not operators, and we're not trying to deal with operators. It was only after the system was already under construction and most of the policy issues which you've discussed had already been decided by those people that, in fact, uh, the Congress came back to Metro and said, well, why don't you run it also? And while you're doing that, why don't you run the bus systems in, in the Washington area? So the original concept of Metro was not the integrated uh, build and operate. And so that did cause a number of issues throughout the design of the system uh, that we probably today would not have done the same way knowing what we know. I suspect that's true about every rail system. Specifically on automation, um, I would say that that's, that's a really difficult issue. Certainly if you're building a light rail system, I would agree completely with the concept that you have put forward that you don't want to have full automation because there are too many potential ways that there can be incursion onto the right of way. In a heavy rail system, there's a balance here and I'm not sure where that balance is. Uh, certainly you're absolutely right if you take all functions away from the operator, you've reduced the attentive, attentiveness of that operator and the ability to respond. Now, that having been said, we have multiple cases where operators have, in fact, responded very effectively uh, in overriding the automatic system. I let me then reject here. I understand that, and I understand that the assumption is that automation allows you to basically um, get more ridership, more trains, with the that the safety um, boundary there is better with automation than uh, hand-operated. That's the theory. Um, but again, it comes back down to the fact of that response time of somebody who is not in operation, the theory s doesn't seem to pencil out when you come down to real life facts that people after year after year of not responding has a very slow response time, right? Congressman Belvray, one, one of the things that we have discovered is that people tend to pay less attention, as you might imagine, if they are in an automated system. Uh, that having been said, one of the things you can do is to increase the number of tasks that they do have to carry out while they're in that system. And as Metro has operated as an automated system, keep in mind that we don't even have to do station announcements with our operators, opening and closing doors and several other functions. Those functions have been deliberately turned over to the operators to cause them to keep their attention. That having been said, Congressman, I don't know where that line is, I must admit. Uh, and that's certainly worthy of substantial additional research. Okay. Um, and let me just say, as somebody who's had to put together the governance board, I totally understand why the unanimous issue was brought up. You have three sovereign states that do not want two basically dictating to the other. I understand that. The issue of rotation of chairs, though, may seem symbolic, but operationally, it is a very, very important issue because if you rotate, that makes the general manager really the only the front line of of governance. And, and the fact is, is that the rotational really does not give you somebody on the board who has hands-on, long-term responsibility on this issue. Has there been any discussion at all about modifying that, or is that part locked into this, this tri-state agreement? Uh, no, Mr. Congressman. It is not locked into the agreement. It is a practice of the board as opposed to any legal requirement. I appreciate that courtesy. The operational issue from the union's point of view. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, as an operator, I operated a train from 1987 to 1997 when I became an interlocking operator. Um, operators have complained about the automation of the system, and, it, and they did then, even though now they're operating in manual, because it took away all of your skills. Unless you um, worked a yard operation, and there's only uh, you have a two-man team in nine yards, and out of 400 and some operators, you can tell how many people actually get the opportunity to do that. That's what horns your skills. And there was a um, constant, um, I think, behavior of taking away 
the duties of the operator. Um, making a, a, a station announcement is one aspect of it, but if your train broke down, you didn't even get the opportunity to go back in and troubleshoot it to repair it. Someone else did that. So you eroded your skills on a regular basis. Um, then we went into the process where uh, we used to have kind of like a pre-certification day where you would more or less go into a training mode and you retrain and you, you kind of horn your skills a little bit and then you would certify. That was taken away. So I think uh, where safety is concerned, there has been a process where the operator has really become very redundant. And then all of a sudden, uh, when we start having system failures, uh, one that is not talked about on a regular basis was when the operators went to total door opening because there is a problem with that 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 is not talked about. Uh, the operators now open and close the doors in manual. And um, even through that process, you know, they're thrust back into this, this manual operations and, and they're expected to perform the same way that the train would when it's operating in uh, automatic with the scheduling and all of that. And it does not work that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I want to, want to say how much I've appreciated this testimony. I always, <laughs> I judge testimony by, by whether I learned something, particularly from you, Mr. Sowers, did I learn uh, that some measures have been taken to improve uh, safety. And that was a very important uh, goal and objective of this hearing. Could I ask all of you <clears throat> whether you would support legislation to create an independent talk funded by the respective state legislatures? Could I just ask all of you for a yes or no answer? Mrs. Sarris? I think it's important that the oversight agency be independent uh, and that it be well funded and well resourced to be effective. Well, of course, you've heard testimony, we've heard testimony from Mr. Rogoff beforehand that it is unprofessional to fund by those being, <laughs> on, 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 those being examined, shall we say. So I'm, it's a two-part question. Do you favor it and do you favor the independence that would come from direct funding from the legislatures of the respective jurisdictions? And I favor them being independently funded, right. and that they should be independent. Thank you. Mr. Benjamin? I, I agree with uh, the statements that Mr. Sarles would point out. Uh, Mr. Sarles made, I would add to that and point out that at the present time, they are independently funded. They are not funded by Metro. They're funded well, by that's the important for the record. They are not funded. Uh, they are not funded by Metro. They're funded by the states uh, and the district. What's the present level of funding, Mr. Benjamin? Uh, the source of the funding is different, I believe, in each one of the areas. But each of the three jurisdictions. Mr. Bassett, what, uh, first of all, do you favor uh, 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 an independent uh, talk? Um, and uh, if you are independently funded, what is your funding? And do all three jurisdictions contribute and in what uh, proportions? Try to answer each one of those questions individually. Uh, in response to your first question, uh, it's always been the position of the talk that we support any initiative that uh, overall improves the case, the, the situation of rail safety in the Washington area and the nation. Uh, we do not take specific positions on individual legislative proposals. In regarding uh, to where uh, our funding comes from, uh, we are funded by the three individual um, state agencies. At what level, please? Uh, we receive each um, jurisdiction contributes its own level of personnel uh, in terms of I'm salaries. For I the don't budget. have those numbers. You don't know what the budget I, I, is. I could not specifically tell you um, how much each jurisdiction spends in could salaries. Could you tell me what the total budget is for the talk? I can tell you how much we spend on an annual basis for consultant support. Do you have a budget, Mr. Bassett? Yes, ma'am, we do. What is the budget? We receive. You're the chairman. What is the budget, sir? Each year, each jurisdiction contributes $150,000 to the talk um, through our administrative agency. $150,000 each. Yes, but that does not include salaries, benefits, or any of the other support that we receive for training or certification. Yeah, and where I do the salaries and important. benefits and support? Where does where does that funding come from? That comes from the governments of the state of the state of Maryland, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and the District of Columbia. 
So, Mr. Benjamin, they are not independently funded. They get their salaries. <laughs> Uh, they, well, well, I don't know. They, they get their budget. They get their budget from the legislatures. They get their salaries somehow, not from the legislatures, but from is it from the county and the city governments? Is that maybe that's it? Maybe that's the independent funding. We are employees of state agencies, and our funding comes from those individual state agencies. Um, Mr. Alpert, did you have a contribution to make on that score? I'm just trying to clear up the confusion, which I think was that my understanding is that they're not employed by a separate organization, the talk, but rather by the Departments of Transportation. So you were sort of asking the question. Well, I did. Oh, well that, that isn't a very important <laughs> answer. Uh, so the talk is not an entity, entity that has employees, including yourself, Mr. Passett. No, ma'am. The talk is a creation of a memorandum of understanding between the three yeah. jurisdictions. It's more of a, uh, a joint task force between three I government agencies. That is very, very important to know. We don't have an organization. We got a task force as a safety oversight mechanism. Ms. Gita, do you uh, support an independent uh, talk funded uh, independently by the re respective jurisdictions? Yes, I do. And I believe that the reason why it needs to be independent, you know, there is this um, for lack of a better term, there, there, is, there seems to be a relationship that is there between talk and the authority. And I believe that although, yes, they have to work together to get information, I think that the talk does need to be more independent so that it does make the kind of uh, recommendations and actually see them through to uh, its completion uh, to make the safety with WMATA more effective. Um, Mr. Charles, I was I was uh, almost heartened by your testimony. I would think your testimony uh, was alone uh, an important reason to have this hearing because I'm not sure the public knows or knew before this hearing the specifics of what you say are now in place as some improvements in safety mechanisms. Could I ask you uh, whether the TOC was a source of any of these improvements or whether they were internally generated, whether they came from the gun report. Could you tell us the source of these improvements? Came from uh, all those sources. I, we took into account what we heard from talk from the FTA, from Mr. Gunn, uh, and frankly from our own employees. Uh, I, I'd like to ask, uh, to ask Mr. Bassett to clear up some confusion, at least I have, from his uh, testimony about this new plan that's gone into effect. You you refer to it in your testimony, and you say the two governors and the mayor considered both the possibility that FTA might directly take over the safety oversight mission from WANA, and that their jurisdictions might establish metro safety a metro safety commission in place of the talk. Now, what exactly does this new proposal establish? The proposal is broken into two individual phases. The first, which is the interim phase one, uh, creates a talk policy committee, which provides direct access from the talk to policymakers of the three jurisdictions. It increases uh, the administrative and executive authority available to the talk chair to respond quickly and effectively to uh, Metro's uh, uh, developing safety situations. Um, and it provides for a more stringent schedule of reporting of safety concerns, both to our own policymakers and to leadership at Metro, including in public forums such as at the Metro board meeting. That is the interim uh, plan that is going to go into effect in very short order as soon as the memorandum of understanding which establishes the talk can be revised. The longer plans that you noted in your question um, are an evaluation of the fact that um, the three jurisdictions uh, who, who, who established the talk want to look uh, beyond the uh, immediate time period for a, a sustainable and strong long-term model of oversight at Metro. Obviously, this will depend very heavily on the legislation that comes from the Congress regarding uh, the FTA's proposal. Well, could so I say to all who assemble here, don't wait on the Congress, please. <laughs> it's very difficult to get something through the House and the Senate. And we, we, we passed this out of committee 
some months ago, a couple of months ago. It's not even to the floor yet. It really has a lot to do, and that's why I'm concerned and, and want to know more about this, this Metro Safety Commission. Do any of you see any reason why the local jurisdictions can't establish a Metro Safety Commission now? If I can, there is no reason why. Um, I, I'm going to have to leave, and I want to uh, turn the chair over to Mr. Connolly, uh, who obviously has been focused on Metro for a very long time. As I leave, I just want to share in the comments Ms. Norton is making, and I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Connolly also to follow up on, on the white paper, because I think we all have serious questions about really when this is going to actually be implemented and meaningful, as opposed to in more concept form, and I really appreciate those questions. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Mr. Connolly and thank the witnesses. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, the, the reason I, I, I expressed some concern is I would have expected, and I know, Mr. Bassett, you're not the one to propose this, but we, this is a, a hearing where we've got to lay out where the responsibilities are. I would have expected something like this, <laughs> this uh, kind of improved task force to come forward literally within the month after nine people lost their lives. So now we got almost a year, and we've got the same kind of a, a, a task force, on only better reporting and better communication as I see it. No new powers, not even a proposal for the legislature to consider powers, not even a proposal for a commission, even if we're not ready yet for what it would take to establish a commission. And that is, uh, uh, that is why I'm, uh, I must ask you, given the time frame, and certainly the, 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 with the certainty that you shouldn't be waiting for the Congress, whether or not these local jurisdictions on their own should be now establishing a Metro Safety Commission, whether you see any reason, uh, any impediments to such a commission being established. Ms. If the respondents could be concise because the time of the gentlelady has expired. Ms. Norton, if I may, that's one of the problems that has been occurring and continues to keep occurring. We have commissions upon commissions. We have group, uh, committees upon committees. This is not a study commission. This would replace the talk. Even to replace the talk, I mean, they're, replacing the talk is only one aspect of it. There needs to be and there should be concise issue, uh, concise procedures and standards in place now, if no other time. We have had, you know, we talk about the nine deaths in the public, but prior to that, we had deaths of employees, and nobody did anything. There's been no study. There's been no group. There's been nobody coming together to talk about what needs to be done. And now all we do is continue. Mr. Gunn did not have to come here to tell WMATA what it needed to do. And it will not listen to those individuals that are inside, that are here, that are doing the work, that continues to say, we need to start doing thus. They have that already. Uh, Ms. Jeter, I, I, I uh, The time of the gentlelady has long expired. Um, we may have an opportunity to have another round. Uh, Mr. Clay of Missouri. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And uh, let me thank you for, the, for holding this hearing. I, you know, thousands of uh, residents utilize the metro system daily, and many of these riders are our very own uh, federal workers uh, who make our jobs possible. And so to ensure uh, the safety of them and others, I'm looking forward to finding solutions to existing problems and addressing some ongoing concerns. And with that, uh, let me start with Mr. Benjamin. Uh, I'm interested in the progress of the uh, Dulles Rail Extension Project. Uh, and I am aware that this is a joint venture between WMATA uh, and several other authorities and that initial funds are being raised uh, through toll increases and commercial taxes. How, however, looking further down the line, we'll uh, WMATA's current financial troubles affect future phases of the extension. Mr. Clay, uh, that extension is fully funded by the state of Virginia, 
and by the and is being carried out by the airports authority so all funding issues are Virginia issues as opposed to Washington Metro issues how about the uh, pro projected ridership uh, what is that how does that compare to, to other lines that are, are in existence that today uh, Mr. Clay, I, I'm not really extremely familiar with that project because it is not a, a, a project which the board has been intimately involved in because it is a